Welcome to Good Chris Elfian Talks. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. And I'm Brian. Thank you for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post a new episode at the start of each week with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to listen to. And now, let's talk more about this week's talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Livermore. I'm a disciple of Christ here in the state of Michigan in the Midwestern United States. And so when the Good Christadelphian Talks crew asked me to provide a few episodes for the podcast, I, of course, was drawn to some different talks I've heard from our Bible school here in the Midwest, the Midwest Bible School. So I've chosen four talks, and the first one that we're going to look at now is an exhortation I heard way back in the year 2007. This is an exhortation that just really struck me so powerfully back then. Hopefully it's as as powerful to you now as it was for me 15 years ago. It's a talk by Roger Lewis. The title of the exhortation is David and Gethsemane. And really, I think it's the, the best talk I've ever heard based off of Luke 22, verse 42, the premise of Christ's words where he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so in the exhortation, Roger sort of takes the story of David as he's fleeing Jerusalem and Absalom's rebellion in 2 Samuel 15 and compares it to when Christ, with his disciples, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the parallels from 2 Samuel 15 to Luke 22 are the basis of the talk, and it's such a powerful comparison character by character, place by place. You know, have your your pens or pencils, have your note-taking tools out. Roger goes through them really quick, but he nails, like, comparing character to character. I think the comparison that really struck me the most, I'll spoil this one, was there's in the text of 2 Samuel 15, there's a particular place that the, the verses point out that David would often go to to worship. There was this known place on the Mount of Olives. And then it's compared to where Judas knew the place where Christ was going to be at the Garden of Gethsemane. So very interesting comparisons back and forth. And the comparison, is, it's not just academic, but it brings us to the lesson how the spirit of Christ really was in David. And in the whole episode of the rebellion in Absalom, David could sit back and just truly trust in God. The text of the story even begins where David just goes forth. He trusts God. He leaves the city, embracing that whatever God's will will be for him, his family, the people, he accepts it. He will accept whatever God has in mind. And that becomes the real thesis and then the real lesson of the exhortation, how both of these men, David and our Lord, trusted, accepted God's will in their life despite the sufferings and challenges. A couple more notes. Uh, Near the end of the exhortation, Roger references several of the hymns that refer to the Garden of Gethsemane. He doesn't mention the hymn numbers, but he dives deep into hymn 216, the third verse, and breaks down how the text of uh, Christadelphian hymn 216 combines both the story of David and the story of Jesus uh, on the Mount of Olives. And there are some helpful practical takeaways at the end of the exhortation as well, about helping us to focus on the glory of the kingdom looking to that for those that also must now in this life share in the sufferings of Christ. It's a very inspirational, very uplifting, interesting, intelligent exhortation. It meant so much to me 15 years ago. Hopefully it's just as powerful for you now. So here it is, David in Gethsemane. Well, good morning, good afternoon, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather then, as we are so privileged to do, to remember now at the close of our Bible school, the story of our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatness of what was accomplished in and through him, and particularly as we come now to the emblems, to seek that we might follow him in the way. And in the second of Samuel, in chapter 15, which 
By the way, is our daily reading for tomorrow, is it not? The daily reading for next Sunday. But we're having our memorial meeting a day early in the Bible school. But in the second of Samuel, in chapter 15, as our brother chairman mentioned, we have the story of David's experience, as it were, in Gethsemane. And we want to take a lesson out of the story of this chapter as we find the matching spirit in the life of Christ and draw a lesson for ourselves that will help us to partake of the emblems and to be spiritually strengthened thereby. So the second of Samuel, chapter 15, tells us in the 13th verse that there came a messenger to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to the past, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And when it says in that verse, lest he overtake us suddenly, literally in the Hebrew it is, lest he will drive the calamity over us. And David understood, brothers and sisters, that this disaster that had come upon the city and upon the people was not their fault, it was his. This was part of the consequence of David's own sin, was it not? And David had that lovely spirit that he sought simply to yield in the matter and particularly not to see the city of Jerusalem a battleground. Let's just leave, says David, and put the matter in the Father's hand. And as the story unfolds, and we read it with those careful eyes, always alert for good Bible reading, we suddenly feel the Spirit of Christ stealing across the page, brothers and sisters, and turning up in the life of the King. Now, you might like to hold your hand in the second of Samuel, And find Luke chapter 22 in your other hand. Because for the purposes of our exhortation, we're going to trace just two or three of the points of connection. Not many, just a handful, but enough for us to be so convinced that there is this remarkable similarity of circumstance in the life of the king that turns up in the life of our Lord. And then out of it all to extract an exhortation that we can draw for ourselves. You see what it says in the second of Samuel, chapter 15. Once the king's servants, verse 15, had vouched their readiness to follow him and to do whatever he asked, somewhat after the manner of Christ's disciples, we're told this in verse 16. It's only a little phrase, you see, but it says, The king went forth and all his household after him. The king went forth. Just a little phrase. But you see, that's really Luke 22, verse 39, isn't it, when it says... And he came out and went. And you see, what we're being told in the life of David is that the die was cast. David decided that he would would withdraw and he would commit himself unto God. And isn't that exactly what's happening, brothers and sisters, in Luke 22, verse 39, that Christ has made the decision, the die is cast, he's going to withdraw for a moment into the garden and commit the whole matter into the hands of the Father. And so Luke says, he came out and went, and Samuel says, and the king went forth, and these two men shared that spirit, you see, of, of, of declaring that they would commit their souls and their will into the hand of him who judges righteously, as our brother said in his opening prayer. And there was a matching of spirits, you see. And we're told in the second of Samuel, chapter 15 and verse 23, that when they traveled on this occasion out of the city of Jerusalem, the record says, and all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over, and the king also himself passed over the brook Kijon, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And do you notice, brothers and sisters, how Samuel tells us that all the people passed over and the king passed over, but somehow they're separated the one from the other. Did you notice that? The king passes over, and so do all the people, but the king does himself. 
And although the people are with the king, the point is that they didn't really understand the king's grief. And they didn't really understand the fullness of the king's spirit. And although, brothers and sisters, on that day, both king and people passed over the brook Kijon together, the king was really on his own, in mind, on his own. David David travelled this journey by himself, you see. Now, isn't that funny? Because on the other side, which unfortunately is not Luke 22, it's John 18, because only John tells us this, doesn't he? John alone says this in his 18th chapter. In verse 1, he says, And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth. Why, that's the phrase out of Samuel, isn't it? He went forth with his disciples over the brook Kijon, where was a garden, into the which he entered, and his disciples. And John gives us the same idea as the second of Samuel, that the people passed over, and the king, and John 18 says, and Jesus passed over the brook Kijon, and his disciples, and his disciples were with him, were they not, brothers and sisters? And yet when they came into the garden, as we know, the Lord would be alone, just like David. And even those closest and nearest to the Lord did not understand his spirit, could not enter into his grief. The Lord walked into the garden in a very real sense, on his own. Just like I think David had in the second of Samuel 15, when the record says that all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over, and the king also himself, passed over the brook Kijon. And surely, brothers and sisters, the Spirit would bid us understand that here in the tableau of the second of Samuel 15, we have our Lord's journey into the garden. Funny thing, you know, brothers and sisters, in terms of of what was happening at this time, because there was such a, a cluster of men, such a cluster of people about David that represented all that was good and all that was bad in the nation, all those different manifestations of human nature that swirled around David at the time of his controversy. And there was an Ahithophel, and there was a Hushai, and there was an Absalom, and there was an Ittai, and there was a Zeba, and there was a Zadok, and there was a Shimei, and there was an Abishai, all these good and bad manifestations manifestations of the flesh. Some loyal, some hostile. They all swirled around David, did they not, at his time of crisis. And it's a strange thing, you know, brothers and sisters, or maybe not so strange, that when we come to the gospel record, we'll find that just as there was an Ahithophel for David that cruelly betrayed him, so there will be a Judas for the Lord. And just as there was a loyal Hushai who stood by his friend, so there will be a Joseph of Arimathea who will plead his cause in the council. And just as there was an Absalom anxious to preserve his position, so there will be a Caiaphas manipulating the Sanhedrin. And just as there was an Ittai who proclaims his undying loyalty to the king, so there will be a John who will intensely follow his Lord whithersoever he goeth. And there will be a Zeba and a Zadok and a Shimei and an Abishai. And there will be a Pilate and a Nicodemus and a Herod and a Peter. And they'll all be there, brothers and sisters, in the life of the Lord, just like David in this chapter in Samuel. And David had to walk through the throng of all those different things, all those different spirits. And try and be guided by that which was pleasing to God. In fact, you see what it says in the second of Samuel, chapter 15. And verse 30 says, David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet. So that's where he was then. He was at the ascent of Mount Olivet. And by the way, I suppose really that's Luke chapter 22 again, because Luke 22 says in verse 39, it does tell us, it says he came out and he went to the Mount of Olives. 
He's in the very same spot as David is our Lord Jesus Christ in, in Luke chapter 22. He came out to the Mount of Olives, says Luke 22, verse 39. And Second Samuel 15 says, And David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet. They're on the same journey, these two, are they not? Literally on the same journey, but on the same journey in mind and heart and spirit as well. In fact, you see what the record says in Samuel. It says that when David makes this journey into the Mount Olivet, it says in verse 30 that he wept as he went up. And that's really Luke 22, verse 44, isn't it? And being in an agony... He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. He prayed more earnestly, says the record. And in that agony that was in the garden, brothers and sisters, we have the counterpart to the weeping David who goes up, weeping up the mountain as he went. And by the way, do you think the Lord cried in the garden? Do you think the Lord wept in the garden as well as agonize in prayer? I'm sure that he cried, brothers and sisters, and I think the reason why we know that is because Hebrews says so, does it not? Because Hebrews 5 verse 7 says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him out of death. Oh yes, I think the Lord cried in Gethsemane, wept before his God, in his time of desperate need. And the weeping of David in the second of Samuel chapter 15 and verse 30 will find its counterpart in the weeping of our Lord as he offered up prayers with tears. It sort of makes you feel rather small and humble, doesn't it, brothers and sisters, when you think of the Lord weeping in the garden and David the king, weeping in the same way. And you notice what it says in the second of Samuel 15. It says in verse 32, it came to pass, when David was come to the top of the mount, where he worshipped God. Now, it could mean, couldn't it, that what it's saying is that He came to the top of the mountain and on this one occasion he decided to worship God. But it could also mean, and perhaps more likely so, that he came to the top of the mount where, well, this was a special place for David that he frequented for worship. It's the place that David always came, the place that David often came. This was David's spot where he used to worship God. And that's John 18, verse 2, which says, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither. John 18, verse 2. Jesus oft times resorted thither is the testimony of that gospel. And here's the testimony of Luke's own account in Luke chapter 22 and verses 39 and 40. It says this. David came to the top of the mount where he worshipped God as if it was his special place. And Luke 22 verse 39 says, And he came out and went as he was wont, says Luke, as he was wont. In other words, this was the Lord's special place for worship and prayer. He came out as he was wont, and he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he was at the place, he said, when he was at the place, and the word that Luke uses for the place that Jesus came to is not the same as Matthew and Mark. The word that Luke uses is used on some other occasions for a holy place or a sanctuary. I think this was the Lord's place where he worshipped God and prayed to the Father. Just like David did on that same mountain. Isn't that remarkable, brothers and sisters? And yet, 
And the real question of the second of Samuel 15 is this. How comes it about that a man who lives centuries before our Lord Jesus Christ can live out the spirit of Christ before it's happened? How comes it that David can go on the same journey as Christ before the Lord himself has come? And the answer, of course, is, well, we must come to the heart of the story to understand why that is so. And the real heart of the story is none of those things that we've seen thus far. No, the real heart of the story is how these two men reacted to this crisis in their lives. And this is why the one will become the basis of the other. And the heart of the story, brothers and sisters, is this. Now, hold your hand in the second of Samuel 15 and make sure that you do have Luke 22 in your other hand. And let's come to the heart and soul of the story that we might see King David and Messiah himself side by side in the same place with the same spirit. Now, you see what it says in the second of Samuel 15. It says in verse 23 that David passed over the brook Kijon. Now, that's the valley floor, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It's right at the bottom. It's right at the foot of the Mount Olivet, right on the valley floor where the Lord crosses over and begins the journey of ascent into the mountain. So that's verse 23. But when we come to verse 32, you'll remember that it says it came to pass when David was come to the top of the mount. So now David's come to the topmost place of Mount Olive. Now somewhere between the valley floor, verse 23, and the summit of the mountain, verse 32, somewhere between these two places and these two moments there must have been the Garden of Gethsemane, must there not? Somewhere between the valley floor, verse 23, and the summit of the mountain, verse 32. And so now see where it is, brothers and sisters, right between those two moments. We're told this in verse 25. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the ark of God into the city. And now look at these words. He is the heart of the whole matter, brothers and sisters. If I shall find favor in the eyes of Yahweh, he will bring me again and show me both it and his holy habitation. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here am I. Let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. Oh, brothers and sisters, that's Luke 22 and verse 42, is it not? He was withdrawn from about a stone's cast and he kneeled down and prayed. Luke 22, verse 42, and he prayed saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Can you see the parallel, brothers and sisters? You see, you see, David says, if I shall find favor, and Jesus says, if thou be willing, and David says, but on the other hand, and Jesus says, nevertheless, and David says, let him do to me as seemeth good to him, and Jesus says, not my will, but thine be done. And the whole spirit of David's attitude becomes the foreshadowing of those famous words of our Lord Jesus Christ uttered in the garden. They're out of the very heart of David, are they not, brothers and sisters? In the very place where we'd expect the garden of Gethsemane to be in David's story, he utters the words of Christ. Let God do unto me as seemeth good to him. It's his will, not mine, says David. Let God decide 
Let God decide whatever might happen to me. See, this is the heart of this parallel, isn't it? That David's got the same spirit as Christ in terms of his attitude to trial. And again, over the page, if you come to the second of Samuel in chapter 16, we're told this. As a man began to curse David, verse 11 says that David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For Yahweh hath bidden him. It may be that Yahweh will look on mine affliction and that Yahweh will requite me good for his cursing this day. I'm in the Father's hands, says David. Thy will not mine be done. This is the spirit of Messiah in the Old Testament. Is it not? In David's own Gethsemane experience, we can see and feel and hear our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, brothers and sisters, there's only three hymns in our hymn book that mention the word Gethsemane. And they're all special. So we've got them all this morning at our meeting. We've sung one already. When my love to God grows weak, we go to the Garden of Gethsemane that we might see the spirit of our Lord wrestling in the garden. Well, here's another one. Can you remember this one? With gentle resignation still, he yielded to his father's will in sad Gethsemane. Behold me here, thine only son, and father, let thy will be done. Do you remember that, brothers and sisters? Do you know in the gospel records, the Lord never says that. Nowhere in the gospels does the Lord ever say, Behold me here, thine only son. That line of that verse of that hymn isn't taken from the Lord's life at all. You know where the phrase, thine only son, comes from. That's Genesis 22. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. But where does the phrase of the hymn come from? Behold me here. And the answer is, well, it's the words of David, is it not? In 2 Samuel 15, verse 26. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, Behold me here, says David. And that's what the hymn's taking it from. And our hymn, brothers and sisters, you've got to understand where our hymns are drawn from, the spirit of them, as it throws the incense of different Bible passages together. And in that glorious hymn about sad Gethsemane, the writer of the hymn weaves together the story of David and the story of Isaac and the story of Christ and brings them into Gethsemane at once. Oh, yes, brothers and sisters, that's where the heart of the story lies. And any one of us in our lives could be living out the circumstances of Christ and be unaware, as unaware of it as David was. And yet that's the very purpose of God, is to teach us the same lessons. And so now, brothers and sisters, there's a reason for what happens. Have you got trials in life? Do you feel that you have trials in life? Do you have anything in life that causes grief or anguish or mourning or fear or bitterness or tears or hardship or pain? I think at times, brothers and sisters, that we all feel that those things have come upon us. And we ask ourselves the questions, why? Why does God do this to us? Why these trials that come upon us in this present mortal life? Why do they come? And the answer is for one single reason. The reason that David learned. And the reason that Christ already understood. It's so that we might be brought to the experience of saying... Thy will 
be done. And it takes all our lives, brothers and sisters, to learn this one thing. It takes all our lives to surrender our own wills, which are so strong and so determined to this one thing in life that we truly believe that God's will should prevail. And now there's reason and purpose to what we go through in life and why it is that such things come upon us. And so we come to the first of Peter in chapter 4 and take up the lesson of the story of Christ in the garden of David in the garden, of two men separated by time, but bound in spirit. And the first of Peter chapter 4, in gathering up the lesson, says this in verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. And you see, I think that's the lesson, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that we're not just suffering trial, we're suffering, we're experiencing Christ's suffering. Whatever we go through, brothers and sisters, it's so that we might live out Christ's trial. Whatever happens to us in life is Christ's suffering in us that we are gathering up, that we are participating in the sufferings of Christ. And if we're suffering as Christ did, then presumably it's for the purpose that we might learn the same lesson as Christ. And what God does in his own good time and his own good way And in his sovereign wisdom, he brings us all at last into the Garden of Gethsemane in our own lives. And there finally, brothers and sisters, we learn to whisper before him, thy will be done. But the lovely thing about Peter is that Peter goes on to say that not only are ye partakers of Christ's sufferings, but when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And one of the things we've got to remember when we come into the Garden of Gethsemane in our own lives, brothers and sisters, is to to never think that, that that's the end of the story, that in the Garden is the end of the story. Because David returned, did he not? In fact, there's reason to believe that when David came back to the city, he came back on the very route that he'd left. He came and he crossed over the, over the river Jordan and he came up the ascent on the back side of the Mount of Olives and down the Mount of Olives and past the Garden of Gethsemane and beyond the Brook Kijon and up triumphantly into the city. And everything that he'd experienced in the second of Samuel 15 was gloriously reversed in David's triumphant return. And there would be glory for the Lord as well beyond Gethsemane. And part of how we learn to submit to the will of God, brothers and sisters, is to see the glory that lies beyond and to know that all that the garden is asking of us is that we surrender to God's will for that glory yet to come, that we might be part of that also. Verse 19 says, Wherefore, let them, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Ah, let them that suffer according to the will of God, thy will be done. Let them do this. Let them commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And so we should, brothers and sisters. And to know that whatever might come upon us in life, is God's special way to lead us into the garden, to bid us to feel David's tears and Christ's prayers, to submit to the same lesson, and to come forth and follow our Lord until the glory shall be revealed. So how do we do it? How do we submit to the will of God? Well, as one brother once said, it's not hard, is it, brothers and sisters? Just difficult. 
And what he meant by that was, it's not hard because we know what it is that we must do. We must read the word of God. We can't, we can't obey the will of God if we do not know the will of God. We've got to read God's word every day of our lives. And we've got to pray to him every day of our lives. And if we read the Father's will and pray concerning that will triumphing in our life, every single day of our lives, then gradually, mysteriously, inexorably, inevitably, God weaves the story of the mind of Christ into our lives as well. And we're thankful. In the end, we're thankful that God brought us into the garden to be with Christ. And we come into the garden of Gethsemane, brothers and sisters, and we're surprised to see, we're surprised to find that there is the spirit of David in Christ Or was it the Spirit of Christ in David in that same place? So as we partake of bread and wine this day and vow afresh to follow him and confess all of the weakness of our humanity before Almighty God and pledge that we will go forth from the Bible school to live like men and women that love the Lord and follow him. As we do all that this day, let's remember, brothers and sisters, that beyond the garden lies the kingdom. And as much as we are called upon to suffer with Christ, let's all rejoice in the glory to come. In the words of a hymn, which says, So may we, as we meet with thee, be sealed more surely thine, and see beyond Gethsemane thy kingdom's glory shine. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. We hope this talk helped you in your walk. If you would like to hear more, please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review in Apple Podcast or whichever service you are using to help more people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this particular talk, please share it with someone who you think might enjoy it as well. For show notes on the talk you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT or check the show notes section of your podcast player. Please share your thoughts on the talk from this week on our Facebook or Instagram pages, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks, on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel where these talks are posted as well. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to our email at goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media accounts. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.